Samir, evolution almost by definition is a, a description of transitions. Uh, but in evolution, the concept of transitions has a much more specific, not necessarily step function, but ways of thinking about evolution. Uh, walk me through that. So the notion of a major transition in evolution um, derives from a 1995 book by John Maynard Smith and Urs Sathmeri, an English and Hungarian evolutionists respectively, in which they argued that the history of life on Earth had been punctuated by a number of what they called major evolutionary transitions, which as you, as you suggest are radical discontinuities in the process of evolutionary change. And they defined them in two ways. Their first suggestion was that a major transition occurs when there's a change in the way that genetic information is transmitted between generations. And their second definition was that a major transition occurs when smaller evolutionary units, such as cells, for example, aggregate themselves into a larger evolutionary unit, such as a multi-celled organism, which then eventually becomes an individual in its own right. Mm -hmm. So it's a process of increasing hierarchical complexity. And they saw that as intimately related to the idea of genetic information and a change in how that is passed on from one generation mm -hmm. to another. So in short, the idea is that there were a handful, perhaps seven, eight, nine, of uh, these major transitions, um, going right back to the dawn of life on Earth. So one of the earliest transitions, for example, was presumably from independent replicators, just self-replicating molecules, to um, networks of replicators, perhaps who could help, help um, catalyze the replication of each other and from there to pro the earliest protocells, and from protocells um, to something like the, uh, the prokaryotic or bacterial cell, from that to the, <clears throat> the eukaryotic cell, um, which of course was formed from yeah, a cell with a, with a nucleus, um, which was formed from the, the symbiotic merger of two prokaryotic cells. And then from single-celled organisms like amoeba, for example, to multi-celled organisms such as uh, multi-celled plants and animals, uh, from there to uh, social um, forms of social organisation such as social insect colonies, mm. for example, which in, in some cases sort of you can think of as, as individuals in their own right. So those are the examples that they had, some of the examples of major evolutionary changes. And what would be the last one in the sequence? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good question. So some, some um, researchers have suggested that humans may be currently undergoing a major transition uh, from the individual, the human individual, to the cultural group oh. or something like that. So possibly culture is the, um, the and, final evolutionary and, and transition. It, 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 is that a legitimate evolutionary category? Possibly. Um, I mean, the, with all of these transitions, there's a the question of, there's been much debated of whether they're really objectively similar to each other or, yeah. or not, or are we just grouping things together, all of which seem like interesting, important <laughs> evolutionary events. Good philosophical question. Uh, that's right. Um, is a philosophical question in part. I mean, I think it's certainly true that culture has dramatically changed the way that humans evolve um, in the, b because we now um, see a process of cultural evolution running sort of alongside genetic evolution mm -hmm. in the human species. So that, that I think is true. I think what's less clear is that um, human groups, even monocultural human groups, really uh, can be usefully analogized to some of the other group level entities that have been formed from the major transitions, primarily because they're not cooperative enough. Yeah, and those were all genetic or, or at least um, uh, physical molecules working. Yeah, that's right. And typically what happened um, in, in, in those earlier transitions, or at least in some of them, is that smaller entities um, gave up their free living existence and sort of coalesced yeah, into right. part of a larger entity. Mm -hmm. So then either gave up, lost the ability to reproduce at all, or could only reproduce as part of a larger whole. Mm -hmm. um, so if you think of a single celled organism, for example, then cell division, which was a way of reproducing for single celled organisms, when multi celled organisms evolved, cell division became. Um, a part of the way that multi-celled organisms grow. Mm. 
Um, so one and the same uh, process, if you like, one cell dividing into two, um, became not part of reproduction, but part of growth mm. of a single thing. Mm. Mm. And that, I think, doesn't have any obvious analogue in relation to human cultural mm. groups. Mm. Uh, how important is this analysis of transition in the whole understanding of, of the philosophy of evolutionary biology? Um, a number of people, including myself, have thought that it, it is philosophically significant uh, for many reasons. One, it, it forces us to ask about what the ingredients of evolution by natural selection are in the most general abstract way that make no reference to any particular level mm. of biological organization. Um, and shows us, for example, that we can't simply take for granted the notions of individual or the notions of reproduction. Notions which have a, a perfectly clear meaning most of the time, if you like. But when we take this expanded evolutionary perspective, uh, they, that forces us to question what we even really mean by an individual mm. in the first place. In that the, what we typically, I mean, colloquially mean by an individual in many contexts is just an organism. Um, in certain contexts will mean a multi-celled organism. But the major evolutionary transitions teach us that a multi-celled organism is really, in a sense, a social group <laughs> made up of cells, and a single eukaryotic cell is itself a social group, <laughs> ultimately made up of um, uh, you know, um, organelles and, uh, mm. and a cell nucleus and other, other components. Uh, which have an independent existence, hmm. thanks to the symbiotic origin yeah, of so, the So, the, so there's the, at each level of the hierarchy, some of the same principles are operating. Well, that, that's what it's tempting to think. And I, I, I you myself, don't want to be oversimplistic. Yeah, I myself think that that is probably true, at least for some of these right, evolutionary right. transitions. But there is always a temptation to sort of see general principles at work when maybe the... Right. When maybe, <laughs> Um, we're, we're sort of reading the similarity into these events sure. rather than discovering you, it. You've also uh, looked at the, um, the importance potentially of evolutionary prediction uh, that once you have your evolutionary theory, which is by nature a historical science, uh, looking back to the past, but looking forward as, as a predictive element uh, that could have consequences, certainly in uh, conservation biology, where you're looking to the, the, the potential extinction of species, uh, potentially in medicine, as you're looking to the, the, um, the uh, mutation rate of COVID. I mean, these are really important concepts. Absolutely. And it, I mean, it's certainly true that some of the examples you give, such as the spread of COVID, um, more generally the spread of antibiotic resistance, mm. or if you think in um, of the use of evolutionary principles, in cancer um, biology to try and understand acquired resistance to chemotherapy and in, in some cases even to be able to make predictions about um, you know, which tissues are more likely to become cancerous and, uh, than others are all examples of um, evolutionary predictions. However, for a long time it's been a sort of source of embarrassment, if you like, that, or potential embarrassment, perhaps I should say, among evolutionists, that the theory of evolution by natural selection, despite being this fantastic integrative scientific theory, flagship scientific theory that in a sense unifies all of biology, doesn't seem to be predictive in quite the way that the theories of physics no, are. No, for sure. Right? Um, but we I mean, if you think of, say, our ability to predict the return of Halley's Comet, <laughs> I mean, really striking, strikingly accurate prediction. Or if you think of a field like quantum electrodynamics, for example, where the uh, the, 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 deg the degree of predictive accuracy is absolutely astonishing. However, it's often seen to people, and this has been a source of philosophical disquiet among, in some quarters with the theory of evolution, that what evolutionary biologists are very good at is explaining things that have already happened, and rationalizing them in sure, terms of Darwinian sure. advantage after they've happened. But could they have predicted those self-same things ahead of time? Well, probably not. Um, so, for example, I mean, think of the, the extinction of the dinosaurs and the subsequent adaptive radiation yeah. of the mammals. Now, perhaps it's too much to ask an evolutionary theory to have predicted the extinction of the dinosaurs, which is obviously caused by meteorite strike, as, as, as most people will know. Um, but think of the events subsequent to that, which led to the adaptive radiation of the mammals and the, the dramatic increase in, in diversity 
of mammalian taxa in the in the years after the, um, the in the, the extinction of the the dinosaurs could that have been predicted by evolutionary biology probably not really mm. I mean so there is some truth to this idea which is bound up with evolution being a historical science as you say that evolution is good at explaining things that have already happened, but is on weaker ground when it comes to making predictions. I think there's some truth to that, but that's not to say that evolutionary predictions are impossible. And in closely um, controlled laboratory settings, they certainly are possible. Um, and in, uh, over short, let's say, microevolutionary timescales where the environment can be treated as largely fixed, um, then it's, it's far more realistic to think that we can make an evolutionary prediction about, for example, the likely fate of a species in the light of in, uh, climate, climate change and mm -hmm. uh, increase in ambient temperature and the, the changes to its habitat. Certainly predictions can be made using evolutionary principles about the, the likely response. So in short, I think um, evolution is unusual in that it's better at explaining after the event than predicting before. That's not to say that predictions can't be made at all.